Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel and thanks for logging on. If you enjoy these videos, do me a favor and subscribe to our YouTube channel right here at Watchbox Reviews. Today we have a no comparison test, a matchup of the mightiest against the scrappiest. It's the Rolex Submariner versus the Ball Roadmaster M Challenger 18. Let's start with the Challenger. The Challenger in name and the Challenger in fact. This is a watch launched in 2018 by Ball partly to debut the company's manufacture movement. So it has caliber 7309 inside, 40 millimeters in stainless steel outside. The timepiece, at least in color, is linked to the Thompson family land speed record cars. And while a dive watch might be a strange automotive tie-in, the hardware is unarguably world class. Now you can see on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, the watch is a 40 like the Rolex, but it doesn't wear like the Rolex. The shape is different for one thing. The timepiece has more of an elongated lug pro profile and it is thicker. On my 16 centimeter circumference wrist you can see that the watch, and I'll zoom out even a little bit more so you get a better sense of scale, the watch sits more like a 42 on the wrist. It's 14.3 millimeters thick and you can see from lug to lug two ways to measure this watch and it does get a little confusing. The actual lug to lug dimension across the wrist here is a relatively compact 47.7 millimeters but when you get close to the end of the watch, you could see that the conforming end link of the bracelet actually extends the case, and substantially so, such that the actual lug-to-lug -lug measurement when you include the integrated bracelet is a more substantial 52.3 millimeters. The spacing between the lugs is 20 millimeters, but you see how the watch avoids the pinched look of a 20 millimeter lug spacing by extending the shoulder of the lugs using an unusual conforming profile end link that actually becomes more of a plug and an extension of the case itself. So we'll throw this one on the wrist one more time just so you can get scale. I would say treat this watch more like a 42. Now there's also a 43 millimeter version of this watch, but stick to the 40. It wears larger than its size and I can't imagine needing a larger case than this unless you're truly a professional NFL baller. Now the timepiece does have a great deal of substance to it. Jumping in real close, we'll give ourselves a bit more light. And the bracelet's nicely made. There's a handsome integration into both the slope of the lugs and the swell of the lugs. You'll also note that the bracelet itself is distinctive. It's anything but an oyster ripoff. You can see it features convex primary links and then concave intermediates for an unusual profile that is all ball. And as you can see, in profile, there's satin finish with a little transitional bevel on the flank, giving the bracelet a rare beauty for a sports watch band. You will note that for a watch with a retail price of $2,000, $49. It is evident where some of the money was saved. Pin sleeves used here rather than screws, but you will see that there is a partial link on each side so you can size properly. There are three anchoring points so you can restation the bracelet inside the clasp, and then there's a full fold-out diving extension. So you have three different ways between the links, the anchoring points, and the fold-out to change the sizing on your wrist. Now, Ball could have saved more money by going with a clamshell system as Breitling often does, but here you can see Ball going with the trigger release system, which I prefer by far to a clamshell or heaven forbid on a sports watch, a friction fit system. So Ball giving you the hardware and the spec where it makes a difference. The case band of the watch is distinctly different from the Rolex, first and foremost because it's thicker, you can see that's no surprise, but also because it's a bit more complex. You can see that the contouring has a little bit more complexity in profile than the Rolex, and I'll show you exactly what I mean. This is the Rolex in profile. There's, comparatively speaking, less to it. You can also see the lugs are a little bit less nuanced, and then, of course, the watch features an unconventional vertical satin finish in comparison to the polished flanks of the Rolex. Let's get one more good angle shot. And then, of course, Rolex with satin on the hoods of the lugs. Here we have polish on the hoods of the lugs. The knurling of the bezel is chunky, and you can see it's satin finished on top of a conical polished segment just below that acts as a sort of plinth. The dial, as well as the bezel, were designed in conjunction with Danny Thompson, who now holds the piston-engined world speed record in the Challenger 2, and the exact same Pantone color used for the car was used for the aluminum anodized bezel and the matte finish zero glare dial. The timepiece features a chunky bezel with deep and sharp knurling for grip. Have a listen. It's substantial, it's vocal, and it feels more expensive than it is. I'll also mention, and this is important, that both of these watches being divers, you have 
an easy reference point that you can measure against the minute hand, and I prefer this to a chronograph. You can keep your Daytona. I'll go with the dive watch bezel every time. One feature the ball has that the Rolex does not is a fully loomed super luminova bezel. So everything that's a numeral, an index, or a calibration is loomed on this bezel. Moving inboard, you can see the dial, and this is where ball switches up a bit. The dial, which features a handsome depth not present in the Rolex, you can see that the hour track itself is stepped up from the center. But ball uses tritium tracer tubes, which are glass capsules that enclose a phosphorescent material and tritium, a beta emitter with a half-life of about 12 and a half years, and that is self-activating. It's not as bright as Superluminova, not initially, but when your eyes adjust, it requires no activation. So if you keep this watch in a drawer for two years, pull it out in the middle of the night, it will glow, it will be visible, and that's important for many who will do their diving at night and will not have a chance to charge up their watch. Oddly, both watches feature a Cyclops eye magnifier, so on that one point, the two brands are in agreement, and oddly, when you go on Ball's website, they describe it as a Cyclops small C rather than a Cyclops large C. Copyright evasion right there? Much. Now the dial of the watch is easy to read, and you can see it is a chronometer. It does have an 80 hour power reserve, and it is 200 meters water resistant. Is it necessary to announce the power reserve on the dial of the watch to the person who's already made the purchase? Probably not, but if you're browsing, it might be a helpful guide. Under the case back, a rare sight on a ball watch, a manufacturer movement. Now it features the amortizer proprietary shock protection system. This is the Ball 7309 automatic 80 hour power reserve, stop seconds, quick set date. It features a 288 beat rate. It is a COSC certified Swiss chronometer, 25 joules, mechanically but handsomely decorated. And of course you could see it all that water resistant down to 200 meters thanks to a no crown guard screw down crown with the Ball logo outboard. And I know some of you don't like the Baroque Ball interlocking R counterweight to their conventional seconds hands, so this watch, a bit stripped down, is for you. Now let's take a quick look at the Rolex. This is a watch all of us know quite well. Originally launched back in 2010, this is the Hulk. This is the 116610LV, the successor to the original Anniversary Submariner. The clasp system features a double lock. One is a clamshell system, one is a lift lock, and now you can see on my wrist, 16 centimeters circumference, we'll zoom out a little bit. By the way, my ISO is a bit high. Let me scale down and give you better color. The watch has a remarkable presence on the wrist, more of a cushion case than a round case. That's always been the Oyster profile. It really does look larger than it is, whereas the ball looks and wears larger than it is. The Rolex wears pretty true to size as a 40 millimeter, and you can see it's far thinner, 12.7 millimeters thick, lug to lug, 48 millimeters on the nose. If you add the solid end link, it is 51.3 millimeters, and there's a 20 millimeter spacing between the lugs with more conventional conforming end link by Rolex. I will also mention you can throw it on a strap, but this watch deserves its bracelet because its bracelet is monstrous. I don't mean that it's overpowering in size or mass, just that it feels multiples its price. It's industry leading. The Oyster bracelet, no new designs here. It's the three link, it's tapered, satin finished tops, polished outer faces, removable links here as you can see fixed by screws, and then the clasp itself is both handsomely finished internally and blessed with that double locking system. So it's not a friction fit system. You can see the beak and hook internally. It snaps shut and then you lock it a second time. Now inside the clasp, and by the way, the clasp is milled out from the solid, so far more substantial than the ball clasp, there's a glide lock system. Pop open glide lock and you have 20 millimeters of adjustment in two millimeter increments. You also, of course, have the ability to remove these links in the bracelet. You can see there's one half link in there. So you do have quite a bit of sizing flexibility with the Rolex. You can use it more as a sizing adjustment mechanism than an all or nothing pull out dive extension as with the ball. The case band, slender. 12.7 millimeters, and of course, less to the case band here. It's not as elaborate as the ball. It's black polished on its flanks, and I appreciate that, but it's not quite as nuanced a shape. That said, it is a timeless design and one that will never date. Big difference between the two watches is the crown guard structure of the Rolex. Now, triple lock crown screw down, but the crown guard's perhaps at the limit in an emergency, a bit more durable. Now, the bezel of the Rolex features a serochrome ceramic insert, but only the pearl is luminescent, so the whole thing doesn't glow as with the ball, but you do get a more refined feel, and thanks to the ceramic cap, you get more scratch resistance. Let's have a listen to this bezel. Make no mistake, 
The bezel sound and ratchet on the ball is bold, but it's bold like vinegar, whereas this is more like a fine wine. Now, the timepiece features a sunburst dial that, at the time of release, Rolex initially described as green gold. Now, I don't know if that meant it was green gold in color or green gold in composition, but they swiftly dropped that appellation, and it has not been heard from since. Nevertheless, it does have the twinkle, the glitter, and the sense of grandeur that you would expect from green gold, if there were such a thing. White gold applique indices here with Rolex's proprietary chromolite. So you have white gold hands, white gold indices, highly tarnish resistant. They will never oxidize. And yes, you have a Cyclops large C window magnifier. Now you can see that the watch is rated to a greater depth, 300 meters. Underneath the case back, Rolex's manufacturer movement, 3135 automatic winding, 48 hour power reserve, 31 jewels, free sprung with a full balance bridge for shock resistance. You have an overcoil hairspring to help the watch earn a chronometer certification in five positions. Rolex actually tested its watches in six, and the chronometer standard is no worse than minus four plus six seconds per 24 hours. Rolex then cases up the watch and times it to no worse than minus two plus two seconds per day, which is the substantive basis for that term superlative chronometer on the dial. So Rolex is making a full watch precision guarantee that the COSC does not necessarily imply. Now you have stop seconds and a quick set date, and of course you have an overcoil hairspring in an alloy known as parachrome blue, which is a blue oxidized niobium zirconium. And if you remember, niobium Niobium zirconium was the alloy invented by IWC, at least in a watchmaking sense, for use in the 1980s 500,000 ampere per meter ingenieur. So this watch might be considerably more anti-magnetic than Rolex advertises. Ultimately, it beats away at the same 4 hertz beat rate as the ball. And they're both certified chronometers. Rolex just goes a little bit farther and gives you a bit more water resistance. So let's talk about the advantages of the Rolex because it has many. This is by no means a dated watch in spite of the fact that it's been with us for a decade. The timepiece has a bracelet featuring solidity, screw fixed removable links, a clasp with two locking systems, a milled out body, and of course the glide lock system that are both head and shoulders, bracelet and clasp above what Ball is offering. Ball, cost competitive and class competitive, but if you want the absolute best, the Rolex bracelet and clasp give you that. Now let's talk about water resistance, 300 versus 200. Does it matter? Only because as a watch gradually loses water resistance between service, it's better to have a margin for error. So if your 300 meter watch becomes a 100 meter watch, you can still swim even if the seals and the lubricants are failing. Your 200 meter watch might not have as big a grace and as large a margin for error. So it behooves you to water test the ball more often, and for some folks that's going to be Advantage Rolex. Status and recognition, this is the name that transcends watches. Even more than Audemars Piguet, Richard Mille, or Patek Philippe, everyone knows Rolex. Rolex is Disney, Rolex is Coke, Rolex is Lexus, Ferrari, Rolex is Apple. It's more than a watch, and if you want your watch to be a status symbol or a totem of prestige, Rolex. I'll also mention that this is the one to buy new. Of the two, it's true, the ball is more affordable, but this is a watch that you buy new for under 10 grand, and ultimately they're selling pre-owned for seventeen dollars to $18,000 right now. So if you can buy this watch new, not only does it instantly gain value to an absurd extent, but it also has a five-year warranty versus the two years plus a one-year registration extension, basically three years, that you get with the ball. So warranty advantage Rolex and value retention advantage Rolex. Also guaranteed precision. It's nice that both of them are chronometers, but for me, Rolex is making quite a boast with that plus two, minus two, and a five-year warranty. That's quite a period in which you could call their bluff and call BS if they don't deliver. So on that simple fact and the strength of that promise alone, Advantage Rolex. Let's talk about the anti-magnetic qualities. That parachrome blue alloy is no joke. It's a substantive difference versus the conventional hairspring on the ball. Both have a degree of anti-magnetism. I believe it to be extreme in the Rolex. Now let's talk about loom strength. It's true. The ball has tritium. Therefore, its dial never needs to be charged. But when you first turn out the light and for a few hours afterward, the loom with Rolex chromolite is substantially brighter to the point that it will be easier under most circumstances to see this watch at night than to see this watch at night. 
I'll also mention that it is far slimmer. 12.7 versus 14.3 is no joke, and I'm going to show you on camera just how big a difference it is. It, it's not quite an order of magnitude because it doesn't meet the definition of that term, but it does feel like a night and day difference. I'll also mention that ultimately this is a timeless and enduring design. Prestige and status aside, it stood the test of time in the best possible way. It's a masterpiece and one that will last forever. It will never look dated. So let's talk about the advantages of the ball because the ball has many. The ball has a power reserve of 80 hours versus 48 for the Rolex. So if you put it down, if this isn't an all the time watch for you, you don't necessarily have to rewind it all the time. I'll also mention value. This watch sells for $2,049 new and pre-owned. It sells for about $1,300. So on that basis, advantage ball. Let's talk about the display case back. It has one. You can see that for which you've paid. And although the movement is principally mechanical and finish, it is interesting to look at. The finishing choices made are good ones. It's distinctive, handsome, and it will never be mistaken for an ETA. Plus, with a diameter over 34 millimeters, it's properly sized for this 40 millimeter case. Okay, let's talk about an everyday T dial. The tritium dial does give you that eternal glow. Every 20 years or so, you will want to send it back to Ball for a dial replacement or a loom replacement, but that's part of the service of owning a tritium Tracer watch. All the other time, it will never need to be energized. So on that basis, if you are going to dive in the middle of the night, long after the sun's down, possibly advantage ball. Underdog appeal. Okay, think Rocky right here. Apollo might have the edge in skill and accomplishment, but this thing came out of nowhere to put up a hell of a fight. And it's not a brash brand on your wrist. It's not a self-conscious status symbol, and it doesn't have the brand baggage of Rolex. Let's talk about the louder bezel. It's not as refined as the Rolex, but it is chunky. For a lot of folks, the bezel that feels and sounds chunkier is going to be the winner, at least among dive watches. A better fully loomed bezel. So you have a fully loomed bezel rather than just a luminescent pearl. Everything on this bezel is visible and you'll see it when we go to the loom shot. It's just easier to see the bezel if you're using it as a timing instrument. And then I also have to say better bracelet integration as there's a sharp break between the awkwardly broad lugs of the Rolex and the smoothly blended profile of the bracelet and end link on the ball. So from an aesthetic standpoint, advantage ball. They actually pull that off against the might of Rolex. So which one of these two do I want? Well, objectively, the Rolex is a better watch. Look, Apollo won the fight. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. But coming out of absolutely nowhere, throwing punches, taking punches, going the distance, this for me is the winner. It stole my heart. It offers unbeatable value. It is the underdog. And it has tremendous original thinking both inside and out. The Rolex is the better watch, but between the two, the ball is the one I want to wear. You guys let me know in the comments below which of these two watches you would choose. Objectively and emotionally, you can make two choices there. Okay, Rolex, Chromalite Blue, and then ball, and you can see the distinction between the tritium self-activating tracers and the bezel of the ball.